we as Americans, we can sit through sporting events for, I mean, football games are three hours, baseball games are, are three hours. So if we go a little longer this morning, it's okay. God's people like hearing God's word, right? <laughs> the golden corral will still be open. But anyway, all right, Romans chapter number five, verse number 16. The Bible says, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So we have here two men. With two opposing sources, with two opposing results, judgment came from one act of sin. And we know from Romans 5, when we look at verses 16 and 17, that condemnation fell upon the entire race. And the effect of that one fall was death was cast upon all men. Right? That is contrasted with the free gift that can cover many sins. So one of the key contrasts as we close out this parentheses between verses 13 and 17 this morning is not just the first Adam versus the last Adam, not just death versus life, but the magnitude of how much more the gift is, how much more grace can cover one sin judgment. God's gift of grace can cover many, many acts of sin. And instead of judgment, he offers everyone justification. Fall of one versus the grace of one. When you look at the effect of grace, look at verse number 16. It says, look at it in the middle. So is the gift. Look at it towards the end of the verse, but the free gift. Look at it in verse number 17. Watch how it's described. Uh, Grace and of the gift of righteousness. Look at uh, verse number 18. We see it again. Uh, It says toward the end, the free gift came upon all. I'm pretty sure you know where we're going with this this morning. It's a gift. It can't be earned. It cannot be something that you merit. It's a free gift given freely. It's a gift of righteousness. Now, I asked you to turn to 2 Corinthians 5. So uh, let's let's flip there and we'll read that. Because the entire race is destroyed by one man's fall. But watch what God can do for the entire race by his grace, by his grace. In Jesus Christ. Here it goes. 2 Corinthians 5. Look at verse 19. The Bible says. To wit. That God was in Christ. Reconciling the world. Unto himself. You couldn't misread that. You couldn't misunderstand that. Unless you were educated. Out of what the world means. The whole world is in view. Not a specific group of people. In the world. His will is to reconcile the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. God's will is not to impute trespasses. And if he had a separate group of people who he wanted to impute trespasses, and they were just condemned to hell and had no choice or say in the matter at all, this verse wouldn't make sense. His will is to not impute trespasses on anybody. That's what his will is. Now, lost man's problem is he's got to get his will in alignment with what God's will is. And we very well know that that doesn't happen. But God wants, he wants the entire race to be reconciled. Man didn't seek God. Man didn't desire God. Man cannot bring about the effect of salvation. But God desired reconciliation with man. And God can affect that. Why? 
It's his love. Brother Eric uh, spoke on this, taught on this so eloquently this morning in Sunday school. Love. It starts with love. It's the offended, <laughs> not the offender that sought the reconciliation. By the way, we're the offenders. We're the offenders. God, the offended. But not, see how it says, not impute, their, not impute their trespasses. God's grace provided a reconciling plan for all of us. He could damn us all to hell. We certainly deserve it. Your child gets in trouble. You send him to what he thinks is hell on earth, his room. <laughs> but there's sometimes when you just show a little grace. You show a little grace. And he doesn't get what he deserves. She doesn't get what she deserves. That's really us. We deserve to go to our room. <laughs> But God, because of his love, because of his grace, because of the free gift that he wants to bestow upon us, he makes a reconciling way. Our God is a reconciling God. Go back to Romans 5. Let's look at verse 17. We'll read the verse again. But if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, we get that. Much more, they which receive abundance of grace, notice much more, notice abundance, and of the gift of righteousness, notice gift, shall reign in life by one, notice reign, Jesus Christ. This isn't about salvation. Now stay with me, verse 17. This isn't about salvation. It's about abundance. It's about gift. It's about reigning in life by one. It is about the absolute power of God to be able to affect that salvation. It's so much more than, well, that's just a salvation verse. Yes and no. It's not just about salvation. It's about the power of God to be able to bring it to effect. It's much more the grace of God, much more the gift that's freely given, much more is Jesus Christ. He has the power to make it happen. And sometimes we lose sight of that. I believe these verses are trying to bring that back into view. It resides in Christ for all men. And if death in Adam is certain, which we can all agree with that, right? Life in Jesus Christ, the idea here is that is so much more certain. And you know how sure it is you're going to die and I'm going to die because Adam shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Now you sin as naturally as you breathe. I sin as naturally as I breathe. When we get regenerated, we should breathe, not sin. Our, our inhales and exhales should be guided by the Holy Spirit that now dwells in us. In other words, instead of naturally wanting to sin, we should naturally be wanting and desiring to live for Christ. That should be our desire. They say um, sunflowers. I'm sure you ladies know more about this than I do if you do any type of gardening. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I've heard sunflowers the face of that flower follows the rising and setting of the sun. And that's something. I mean, that's a beautiful thing when you think about it. Shouldn't we be like that sunflower? Wherever the Lord's guiding us, our, our face is just wherever, wherever the Lord is leading, whatever the Lord's guiding, whatever the Lord wants. We no longer are facing that sinful lifestyle, but we're like that sunflower. Now, praise God. Isn't that wonderful truth? But here's something that I really wrestled with preaching and, and, and fitting it in. And I felt the Lord would have us all go through this because. Do you believe salvation is by grace? 
You believe it. It's not of anything you can do, but all that Christ has done for you. Let me ask you this. Do you think you can lose it? I don't. But there are many people that do. And they think they will lose the gift. Even though it says it's a gift of righteousness. So I want to address that. And I'd like to address that by going to Galatians chapter number 5. And showing you a verse that has been used to show that you can lose your salvation. So we'll read this verse together in the context. And then you be the judge of the scripture and you be the judge uh, of whether or not this teaching or preaching is right. I believe it is, or I wouldn't teach it, but I'm not the authority. God's word is watch what it says in Galatians chapter number five, verse number four, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen out of grace. Except when you're looking at the text, you know I didn't read that right. Because it clearly says, look at it again, the end, you're fallen from grace. And you know what you can fall from? You can fall from grace. But you know what you can't fall out of? You can't fall out of God's grace. And that's important because can a Christian lose their salvation? No, they cannot lose their salvation. But you lose the ability to live a successful life in Christ. If you fall from his plan of grace, well, what does that mean? What was the problem with the Galatians? They were saved by grace. They understood the gospel. These Judaizers now are coming in and they're getting them all confused and trying to put them back under the yoke of bondage of the law. And Paul is saying, wait a minute, what are you fellows doing? You were saved from that. Don't fall from that. <laughs> you know better. You know better. Um, watch the buildup in Galatians 5. Go to the first chapter so you can see this. Galatians 5.4 isn't teaching you can lose your salvation. It's teaching that you can be saved by grace and fall from that grace when you lose sight of what saved you to begin with. Don't go back under the bondage of the law, which is what the Judaizers wanted to put them under. Galatians 1 verse 7, watch what it says. Well, verse end of verse 6, uh, called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another. Probably makes sense to read the beginning of verse six, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Is there any other gospel that we should preach? No. Paul says it's not another under the Holy Spirit's inspiration. And he says at the end and would pervert the gospel of Christ. There's only one gospel of grace. And they're losing sight of that gospel. Look at Galatians 3. Look at verse number 11. Galatians 3, 11, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. Does it get any clearer than that? Keep as many laws as you want. It will not render you justification before God. Look at verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of God. The law being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. He redeemed us from that law. Look at verse 24. The Bible says in Galatians 3, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. What was that law's job as a schoolmaster to do? Bring us to Christ. That law reflects back to you who you are and who I am. Sinful people that can't keep it. It doesn't show you how to get to heaven. It shows you how you can't get, to, you can't get there that way. For ye, uh, or it says that we might be justified by faith. You show them the law. They can't keep it. They see that they're lost. 
God said justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. The law did its job. Does that make sense? You don't put people back under the law. How do you do that? You require them to do certain things and not do other certain things that may or may not even be in the Bible as a cause and effect for them keeping their salvation. <laughs> and if everybody has a different list of what sins are allowed and not allowed, you got yourself a mess. Nobody's going to know if they're saved or not saved from here till Tuesday. The law did its job. Now you're not under that law anymore. You see that build up in Galatians? Go to go to Galatians. Uh, go to Galatians four. Look at verse number four. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to what? Verse five, redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. You can't reverse an adoption. <laughs> I mean, I guess legally down here, you could probably force the hand. Who would do that? God has adopted you. You're his child. If you've trusted him. So Galatians 5, 4. Well, well okay. Let, let's stay in Galatians 5. Because here, here, here's right in that same chapter. There's a build up. We saw. You don't fall out of grace. You fall from grace. But look at this. Because this here. Is another verse that folks use. To say you can lose your salvation. Look at verse 18. But if ye be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. How many of you have trusted Christ as your savior? You know for sure that you've repented of what you had your faith and trust in. Whatever it is, it don't matter. It's wrong. And you put your full faith and trust in Christ to save you. And you knew you were a sinner. You knew God was righteous and just and sending you to hell. And now he's placed you into his body because you've trusted in his work. If you've done that. What were you baptized with? What were you given the moment you believe? The Holy Spirit. Not a worldly spirit. It's called a Holy Spirit for a reason. Because okay? <laughs> that Holy Spirit will guide you and I to live holy. You don't get it on Monday, lose it on Tuesday. Earn it back on Wednesday, lose it on Thursday. Get a half a tank on Friday and have to fuel up again on Saturday. It's not the Holy Spirit of the Bible. That's the Holy Spirit of those that think you can lose your salvation. <laughs> but if you're led by the Spirit, which you have, you are not under that law anymore. Watch the contrast. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Those are pretty bad things. <laughs> That's a long list of sins. And then it says, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And so people go to this verse and say, see, you can lose your salvation. Because that kingdom of God, we know that's a spiritual kingdom. That's what we're a part of. Except the context of this chapter is showing the contrast of what you were and what you are now. You were led by these works. Now you've been regenerated. You have the Holy Spirit. You should be guided by the Holy Spirit. People say, well, I just still think you can, you can lose it. Look at the contrast. Verse 22. It's again contrasted. 
But the fruit of the Spirit is joy, love, peace. You see it? Between those lists of sin and the works of the flesh, look at verse 18 and look at verse 22. The beginning of verse 18, look at it. But if you be led, then you got these lists of sins, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Look at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is... And watch what it says in verse 24. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. It is a contrast between lost people and saved people. And when you were lost, those sins you did, that's who you were. You're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You need a new life in Christ. And when you get a new life in Christ, now you're dwelt with his Holy Spirit. And that spirit will lead you and guide you. People say, well, I still think you can still lose it. Because it says that you won't inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, then every single person has lost their salvation. No, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't committed fornication. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 for a second. You see these. Let, let, let's look at two of them. Um, these works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication. Let's, let's, do, let's do the adultery first. Go to Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Matthew 5, verse 28. You all know this verse. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman that lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Matthew 5 says adultery starts where? In your heart. Galatians 5 says, if you want to make Galatians 5 and these list of sins... As a way to lose your salvation, the first one on the list, everybody's lost. <laughs> because just about every young person that has hit puberty and older has lusted after someone that they shouldn't be lusting after. And adultery starts in the heart. Now, God forbid if it manifests into the physical, that's worse. But Jesus defines adultery as, hold on now, hold on now. Starts here. What is your heart lusting after? Or who is your heart lusting after? You know what God called that nation? Adulterers. You know why? Because in their heart, they lusted after idols, something other than God. If you have to keep it, you and I lost it. Because it's impossible for anyone to live 100% righteous. 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. Watch this, 1 Corinthians 5, it is reported, verse 1, commonly, that there is fornication among you. Who's the you? That would be the Corinthian church. And such fornication, as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Are you all puffed up, and have you not rather mourned, and he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you? For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has done, that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan. I'm going to stop right there for a second. The Corinthian church is made up of who? That be believers. So that means they would be in the same body of Christ that we would be in, right? Not the same local church, but the same body of Christ. And they're doing horrible things. Galatians 5 said fornication 
not the kingdom of God. And I'm presenting to you the Galatians 5 as a contrast between lost people and saved people. What they're led by, works of the flesh or works of the spirit. That's the whole contrast of Galatians 5. It's not teaching you can't, it's not teaching you can lose your salvation. And you know what 1 Corinthians 5 is? You got a church where, where a brother, a believer is committing fornication. And you know what you got to do in a situation like that? You got to get that man out of the church. You know why you got to get that man out of the church? Because the other wives are at risk. That's why. <laughs> the other young ladies are at risk. That's why. Now, when we get that man out of the church, you think he leaves the body of Christ? No. He leaves this local assembly, and the idea is to reconcile him, to bring him back. But you can't just let sin run rampant and let it go. Now, we see at the end of this verse uh, that I kind of cut everybody off at. I did that for a reason, to kind of break the, the train of thought for a second. To deliver such an one unto Satan for what? The destruction of the flesh. That the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. His spirit's all right, but his body's got to go. <laughs> You need to get out of here. It's church discipline that isn't fun. It's not a fun game because it's not a game. Someone does a sin, it may disqualify them to fellowship. And by the way, there's a short list of them. You don't want sexual predators nesting in church pews. Well, Brother Jimmy, aren't we under grace? We are under grace. And the God of grace says, if you've got sin like that in the church, you don't want it to affect the entire congregation and put someone unknowingly at, at risk. I don't want to be a mean guy. It's just that's, okay. Does it make sense? If that has to happen, we didn't get them out of the body of Christ. We're saying, look, you can't be fornicating here. You can't be a known fornicator. And expect everybody to be okay with your sin. And I've heard stories and I've seen things happen where you get two people shacking up and they want to come to church. Great. You really need to stop shacking up, though. You really need to stop shacking up. And when I first got started, there's someone called and said, um, we, we're looking for a church. And um, we're looking for someone to marry us, a Baptist preacher to marry us. They weren't really looking for a church. They were looking for a Baptist preacher that would marry them, that was OK with them living together without being married. And I said, well, do you have a church to go to? No, we just kind of moved here and we're just looking to to get married. And, and I, so, you know, I, throughout the conversation, you realize they're living together. I said, well, you're welcome to come to church, get to meet you. But if you're shacking up and living together, you know, that's not in the Bible. <laughs> I said, but you're welcome to come. We can meet. And of course, they never came. The idea is. You want a spotless church. You want a blameless church. You want sinners to come. But you got to keep things in check. And if someone isn't willing to reconcile and they're doing that sin. And they're not willing to have any type of accountability. then you've got to say, hey. For the sake of this local assembly. You can't have your fellowship in here. Now, that's a horrible conversation to have. And I know it may sound odd saying this. Because we've never done those types of things. But they didn't lose their salvation. They lost the privilege to fellowship with other believers. 
but they didn't lose their salvation. Go to James 2, because if they did, again, I really want to harp on everybody. I want everybody to know, I don't want you to sin. And I'm not saying you can't lose your salvation to give you a license to go out and sin. But look at James 2. James 2 says, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. You keep the whole law. Go ahead through your mind, all the laws you keep. Now allow God to just pick out that one. <laughs> and you know what he says? You're sunk. Which means if you if it's on you to keep your salvation, go ahead and keep all the law, fail in one part, and God says you're guilty is you're just considered guilty of everything. In other words, we'll lose it every single day. We really will. All liars shall have their part. Lake of fire burns fire and brimstone. That's why we got to get in Christ. Because one little lie will separate you from God. Go to Jude. The second to the last book in the Bible. That was for somebody. Because I, I made a blunder on Zechariah one time. But this truly is the second to the last book in the Bible. The book of Jude. And the book of Jude. You know, there's somebody... There's somebody that will keep you from falling. Let's find out who that somebody is. Jude, verse 20. But ye, beloved, that be believers, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. That's a good thing to do. Verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Now, we have spouses here. One spouse can't make the other spouse love them. And God isn't going to make you love him. He loved you. Is that enough? You should love him. God is a perfect gentleman. He isn't going to force you to want to serve him or force you to want to love him. But keep yourselves in the love of God because you want to looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, we look for a blessed hope. And we'll enter into eternity at that point. Our, our focus shouldn't be down here on earth. It should be it should be on eternal matters. Verse 22 and watch what it says. And of some having compassion, make a good difference. Is that you? Because that's a New Testament command that God gave us. Has there been a time in your life this week where you didn't have compassion and just chose to not make a difference? Because really, Lord, I just don't care. If you've ever thought like that and you can lose your salvation, guess what? We've all lost it because <laughs> we have all thought like that. I do so much outreach that sometimes I'm just thinking, Lord, what good's it going to do? I'm going to get the same stuff again. <laughs> I'm going to get the same people telling me the same thing. Why don't I just stay home? When I think that, I didn't obey this command. Have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. If I don't have compassion to the lost, I'm not obeying the Lord 100%, which means if I could lose my salvation, I lost it. I will tell you, every time I think like that way, but I go out and do something, at the end of it, I always say, thank you, Lord, for giving me that little nudge that I needed. to." You get the bulletin in the email, and you know the Bible says pray without ceasing. But you get the bulletin, but you're in the middle of whatever. And you say, you know what? 
I know there's an outreach coming up this week, weekend, but somebody else will pray. We commanded to pray without ceasing, bathe everything in prayer. If you could lose your salvation, you would have lost it. You keep the whole law, you offend in one point, you lose it. There's somebody that's able to keep you. There's somebody that's able to keep me. Watch what it says, verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. You can't present yourself to God faultless, but Jesus Christ can. He is our advocate and he will keep you. He has saved you. He saved you. He is powerful enough to keep you. And he is the one that will keep you from falling and present you before God the Father faultless. Praise his holy name. Amen. Go to John 3, 36. Well, I just, people, I just don't feel like I'm saved. Okay. You ever go to, you, you, you ever hear somebody that go to the doctor? Doctor gives them this bad news. He gets checked out and the doctor says, you've got cancer, man. You got stage four cancer. You're going to die. And the guy says, well, I don't really feel like I'm going to die. <laughs> and the doctor says, look, I know this is shocking news, but the x-ray, the MRI, the CAT scan, all the reports, you've got cancer, buddy. And you ain't going to make it. Well, I just feel fine. I don't really feel like I have cancer. It's irrelevant how you feel. I just don't feel like I'm saved. It's irrelevant how you feel. Stop being led around by your feelings. Look at John 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Have you believed on the Son? Yes. Well, I just don't feel like I'm saved. Have you believed on the Son? Yes. Well, I just don't feel like I'm saved. Quit going around with your feelings. What else does it say? He that hath believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You ever hear anybody say, well, I just don't feel like the wrath of God's on me. You ever tell a lost person, hey, look, the wrath of God abides on you as if they're going to feel something. We don't say it the other way around. <laughs> we just say we don't feel it because somehow we need to think we got to kind of get in some uh, emotional experience. The wrath of God abides on a lost person. Whether they feel it or not is irrelevant. If they have not believed the son, the wrath abides on them. You know what religion is? Reliance. That's religion. I'm leaning and relying on. I'm leaning on this pulpit. If I'm trusting in my ministry, if I'm trusting in my church membership, if I'm trusting in the things that I've done for the Lord. You you move that out of the way and I'm going to fall. I'm going to fall right into the depths of hell. Because religion is reliance. And you just mark that down as a fact. People are relying on religion. If I believe in the son, I can lean and lean and lean and lean on God. I move my hand away. I'm not falling because he's going to keep me from falling. God is. He's able to keep me. What's the point of a free gift if after I receive the free gift, I've got to keep it? It's not a free gift freely given. It's a free gift with strings attached. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath. What type of life? Everlasting life, not temporary life and shall not come into condemnation. There's no condemnation then which are in Christ Jesus. But it's passed from death unto life. I pass from death. I get into life. Do you think I fall back into death? It doesn't say you must be born again and again. 
born again, and that's it. You pass from death unto life. Get John 10. Everybody got, everybody okay with, with this? Okay, John 10. I heard one baby amen in the back. That's it. Hope everybody's all right. Amen. John 10, look at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them temporary life. Nope. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. That is such a clear verse. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You're not sitting on the hand of God the Father and a big wind comes away and just blows you off. You're in there. It's alive. You're part of that. That chicken feather and a chicken, you got to pluck that thing out. It's an alive thing that's in there. No man can do that to you. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hands, of my father's hand, father's hand. And I and my father are one. Man, that's some powerful words from Jesus, isn't it? Wouldn't you have loved to have been on the scene on that? I don't know how you can miss eternal security, except the Jews did. Watch what they did. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. <laughs> can you imagine that? They're standing right there with Jesus. He tells them they can have eternal life. He says they'll never perish. He says nobody can pluck them out of my hand. They don't want to hear it. They want to stone them. Now, isn't that something? Isn't that what religion does? Eternal security. Once saved, always saved. No, it's not a license to sin. Galatians 5, it talks about walking wherewith in the liberty you've been given. I botched the verse a little bit, but the idea of Galatians 5, 1, when it starts, is you've got liberty. Well, aren't you afraid if you say eternal security, if you say once saved, always saved, isn't someone going to just live however they want? Yes, because we all live however we want. <laughs> Duh. What are you going to do tomorrow? You're going to do what you want to do. <laughs> Do you want to live for God? We could be a church or I could be a, the style of preacher that just scares everybody half to death into wanting to live for God. Send in your W-2s at the end of the year and we'll make sure that you're given 10%. And if not, you know, you make some severe consequence up that isn't in the Bible, but it scares people into giving money or you... If you don't if you don't witness and if you don't pray and if you don't come to church, if you're not here every time the doors are open. God's going to strike your family dead or something. I mean, you, you can come up with all types of ways to scare people into living for God. If you had to do that with your spouse, I'd guess you probably don't have a happy marriage. You know? So you love me or else. I mean, what is that? That's not how God works. People will live the way they want to live. I want to live better for the Lord. I want to lean on his Holy Spirit that he's given me. Not going not gonna to lose it. Not going to lose it. Go to 1 John. 1 John 2. We'll start to wrap up. This free gift of righteousness is nothing you and I can do to keep it. First John 2. My little children, these things, write I unto you that you sin not, because God doesn't want you to sin. And if any man sin, because it kind of works out like we always do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. I don't know how you can miss that it's for 
The offer is for the whole world. And if you've trusted Christ, God's not our landlord looking to evict us because we didn't pay the rent by means of good works. He's our advocate. And if we sin, he's there to keep us from falling. We are. God the Father sees the payment of his son. But you see the command, hey, don't sin. Do not sin. And that's what we preach from the pulpit. We preach against sin. We preach against all the sins that the modern church says you can do. Don't sin. But if you do, you've got an advocate. First John 5. First John 5, look at verse number 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record that God gave his son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. And he that hath not the son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God. People have asked me before, look, I just, I just don't, I, I just don't know if I'm saved or not. I bring him to this verse all the time. Have you believed on the name of the Son of God? Yes. Then you're calling God a liar if you don't believe that you're saved. <laughs> I don't believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I don't want to trust him. I don't, I don't, I think I'm good enough. Okay, you're lost. And the wrath of God abides on you. But you believe in the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. God wants you to know for sure that you have eternal life, not temporary life. He wants you to know you've passed from death to life and you've got eternal life. But you must come to God, God's terms. Believe on him. He is not a liar. People are so focused on their own works that they forget about God's work. God's work. Titus 1, 2 says, God, he can't lie. If God wanted to lie, he couldn't do it. It's part of his character. He can't lie. Stop worrying about your works and remember God's work. Go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number one. Four more reasons why you cannot lose your salvation. Ephesians 4, uh, Ephesians 1, I'm sorry, Ephesians 1, verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. That's the first reason why you can't. Because God has blessed us. Look at verse number 4. According as he hath chosen us. The second reason you can't lose your salvation is that he blessed us and he's chosen us. That's reason number two. In him before the foundation of the world, when you have eternal life, uh, everlasting life has a starting point and no ending point. When you're in Christ, you have everlasting Life. It starts when you trusted him and it goes on forever, everlasting. You also, when you trust Christ, you have eternal life. Eternal life doesn't only go forward, it goes backwards. <laughs> it's eternity. It's outside of time. What do you have when you're in Christ? You have both. And what God predestinated, what he foreknew, is that those that trust in him and are in him aren't called to go anywhere in this verse. They're called to be something. You know what they're called to be? Holy and without blame before him in love. That is what God predestinated. All those in Christ are to be holy. Third reason is, it says, verse five, having predestinated us. First reason, he blessed us. We're going to keep it. Or he's going to keep us, whether way you want to say it. Uh, the second reason, because he's chosen us. The third reason is because he has predestinated us. Look at this. Unto the adoption 
of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. This predestination has to do with God adopting you. And he's not going to relinquish that adoption. And the last reason, verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now, unless you want to argue the predestinating power of God, I would say that we are all signed, sealed, and delivered under the day of redemption. Four reasons. You cannot lose your salvation. According to Ephesians 1, he blessed us, he's chosen us, he's predestinated us, and he has made us accepted. And it's all what he did, nothing what we can do. Aren't you glad for grace? Aren't you glad for grace? Amen.